Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining this webinar, uh, our very first uh, workshop. Uh, we named it the BRCA workshop for patients and family with hereditary cancer. We started this, uh, this clinic and program in 2015 after it became very clear that there's an increasing number of uh, individuals who are carrying a mutation that predisposes them to a higher risk for, for cancer. We also wanted to have a very concerted effort around screening and prevention uh, methods for, for young individuals not to have cancer. We, the program is also directed towards developing new screening tools, new tests to detect cancers early, as well as to develop new strategies for patients who actually have cancer. The program and clinic is called the Hereditary Cancer Clinic. The program is called the BRCA Center for Research in early recognition that this is probably one of the very early genes that we recognize is a, a very strong predictor of the risk for cancer. We were fortunate to have a, a generous donation from advocates to actually make this workshop happen. And then the countless and tireless uh, hours spent of my team over the last few weeks to get this uh, program and uh, and this workshop up and, and running. Today, we will talk about uh, testing family members, talking to and testing relatives. When do we test? Who do we test? And also, how do we test? And I'm very fortunate to have uh, Julie Mack, our chief genetic counselor for the BRCA program, give us a, a quick summary on what's relevant uh, when you start thinking like, should I get tested? I am positive. How do I get my relatives tested? Julie, are you ready? I am. I think my video is disabled. It's, oh, here we go. Hi there. <laughs> Technical, technical problems, but I am here. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. And I wanna thank everyone who's joined us for taking some time out of a really beautiful spring evening. Um, as Pamela was saying, we um, want to take care of people on all sorts of fronts. We, we have research, we have a clinical arm, and this is really a way of um, providing both education and community um, to the people that we work with. Um, we have a great panel of speakers. Um, besides myself, I'm here just to give us a little bit of the technical background and um, to help us lead into a discussion with some um, families who, you know, who would be a better expert on talking to their families and some of the people who um, are living through that themselves. Um, so just as um, Pamela was saying, I'm going to talk about why family testing is so powerful um, and also, you know, when timing of talking to family members um, and just really some of the nitty gritty details of how to talk to family members, how to get tested. And then, as I said, we have um, some really fantastic panelists who've given us their time, um, which I'm looking forward to. So I don't have to tell the people who show up to this type of event why genetic testing matters. Um, you may have the same experience I do when I, uh, when you tell people about your family history or when I tell people that I meet at a soccer game, you know, what I do for a living, they often sort of have this look on their face, like, why, why would you want to know that? And why would people want to do that? Um, but we, and, and I, and I get it. And, and all of you get it, that this is not an easy topic and not an easy, um, not an easy medical condition to live with, but we also know that, um, and I say this out loud all the time, if I see some familiar names on the participant list, you've probably heard me say, um, because I have to remind myself, it feels like such a big moment when we do this genetic testing, but we don't make 
somebody have a genetic risk or not. And um, what we're trying to do is, is find out who has that genetic risk already. Um, and that is information that just as um, Pamela Munster was telling us, we can use to prevent people from getting cancer. We can use to help people catch cancers earlier when they're more treatable and more curable. Um, and just in the last five to 10 years, we're seeing so many really interesting advances in the way we treat cancers that are different for people who have a genetic um, cause for their cancer. So there's a lot of good reasons to get this information. And again, I know um, I'm talking to people who already know that themselves, but just as a reminder. Um, and again, some of this you may already know, but I often like to start from the beginning to make sure we're all using the same language. Um, and this applies to, I, I know we have, uh, may have a couple of people with different types of genetic risk factors in their family, but um, you know, when I talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2 or BRCA1 and 2, a lot of the information would apply to um, some other hereditary conditions. Um, and so how are these inherited? We know that both men or people who are assigned male at birth and women or people who are assigned female at birth can be affected by cancers related to these genes. Um, BRCA1 and 2 are genes that everybody has. Um, and just like all the other genes that are more fun to talk about, like hair color and eye color and how tall you are, these are genes that have a special job in your body and their special job is actually to help um, repair things and protect our body from developing cancer. What we know is that some families, including many of the families in our audience and on our panel, um, have a version of one of these genes that isn't doing its job properly. And some one of the kind of more colloquial ways you'll hear that referred to as a mutation. Um, and so that's what this, um, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer here, that's what this picture here is showing. Um, we each get two copies, let's say this is BRCA1 of the BRCA1 gene. Um, one from our mother, one from our father. And here we're showing that this person, this is the, um, a man here who has a mutation or problem with this gene. Um, <clears throat> this is something that puts him at higher risk for getting cancer. He may not get cancer for sure because he still has another copy of BRCA1 from his other parent that's working fine. He's still got lots of other genes in his body that's helping him out, but we know that he has a higher risk of getting cancer than um, other men. Um, and this is picture shows how this is inherited, which may for some people be a bad flashback to high school biology. Um, when this um, couple has children, the mom in this family is always going to pass on a copy of year day one that is working properly. That's what the blue is um, to each of the children. And the dad in this family can either pass on this one that has the mutation or the one that doesn't. And so you'll see that about half of the kids are going to inherit it, about half of them won't. Um, and some of the important things to show here, because this is these are genes that most mostly increase the risk of breast and ovarian cancer, although they are definitely related to other cancers we'll talk about, because they mostly increase breast and ovarian cancer. A lot of the times the focus is on the women in the family, and it's really important to be talking to women and men, because men can also get cancer and men can also pass on um, these mutations. And the other thing that I really want to point out here that, um, you know, is not as dry as just an old genetics textbook, is that even when there, this is in the family, about half of the kids, half of the next generation will not have that mutation. Um, and this is a term that in genetics we call a true negative. It's a normal test result that is kind of like an extra good normal test result because we know that in this family, a lot of the cancers are being caused by a very specific mutation. And so the people who don't get it, even though there's all this cancer in their family, um, they would be considered an average risk for developing cancer themselves. And this is um, something that I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate because it, it's a much shorter conversation, right? That's a, that's a 10 minute appointment for me compared to an hour or two with someone who's tested positive. Um, and a lot of people might even be afraid to get tested because they think, well, why would I just go in there and find out about something that I already know I have and everybody in my family has? And why would I wanna go in and just get um, scary news? Um, and so this is just a moment for us to remind you that in a family with a genetic mutation, about half the people won't have it, half of the people who test, who were really worried because they've watched their family members go through this, 
are going to get a normal result and actually find out their risk is lower than we thought it was. Um, so I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but that's something that we really want to remind people. Um, it doesn't, as I said, need as much time to talk about, but it's actually half the people in your family. Um, and this is really interesting to me. I know this is much more about individuals and our work is much more about individuals, but there's some very interesting kind of like population data that we can look at. Um, if we agree that knowing who has a genetic risk is really important, um, how do we find all those people? If we just walk out on the street and start testing people, which is happening in various settings, um, about 1% of people is going to have some type of genetic risk for cancer. So we're doing 100 tests to find one person. Um, if we walk into the breast cancer clinic and test everyone with breast cancer, which is also happening in many places, um, that's about 5% of breast cancer, 5 to 10% of breast cancer. So we're still running about 20 tests to find one person with a genetic mutation. If we walk into ovarian cancer clinic, um, which we also do and try to test everybody, um, there's about a 20% chance of finding a genetic risk factor like a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. We're still running five tests to find each person who has this risk. Um, if we go to the brothers and sisters, the parents, the adult children of somebody who has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, they have a 50-50 chance because of what we saw on the slide before. And so it becomes a very um, powerful way of finding people who are at risk and helping them and getting them connected to what they need. Um, and this was really interesting. I actually, given what I do, I, I did not see this particular study until very recently. Some people who are much smarter at math than I am um, did a calculation and figured out that if we could test 70% of the relatives of somebody who had tested positive um, for 18 particular genes that they were you know, um, looking at, including BRCA1 and 2 and other similar genes, and that we would be able to find all of these people at high risk within 10 years. We know that every family is different. It isn't always possible to get 70%, um, but it really, um, I think it was very motivating for me to hear that statistic and just realize, of course, the most important thing is to help the person you care about, your cousin, your brother, your sister, your child. But we're also, um, by doing that, you're actually just making such a big impact on the whole population. So that was very, as I said, just very motivating to me to hear. Um, so I'm going to shift from the, the boring science part um, to really some of what you might be wondering about is like, well, when, what's the timing of me talking to my family members? If I know that our family has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or another genetic mutation, um, when would I talk to different people in the family? Um, and again, I want to emphasize that you know your family best, every family is different. Um, and so this is some general information, um, but of course, you know, we are happy to have individual conversations with each person. Um, in most cases, um, we're talking about children under age 18, um, genetic testing is not recommended. Um, and it's not just not recommended because we don't want the information, we understand, we all care, we all know this is important. But thankfully, we know that genes like BRCA1 and 2 um, and many others, the mutations don't cause cancer in children. We don't see those cancers in really young people. Um, and so we don't, um, if, if you have any kids or you've been a child or you've seen somebody, you know there's so many things you have to deal with at age 5, age 10, age 15 that are really important in their development and in their lives. Um, and Thankfully, this is not one of those things, and this is something that really can wait until they're adults. And um, certainly, there may be times that arise where it's appropriate to talk to your children about a mutation in the family, and that could be if they're asking you questions, and that's always a good time to talk to answer them honestly, um, or if you or somebody else in the family has cancer or is having a surgery or a procedure, having a colonoscopy, having a procedure to remove the ovaries for preventive reasons, that might be a time to explain things as well. Um, you know, we, again, this is something we could go into more in a personalized conversation, but as a genetic counselor, we just remind people that it's important to you know, give honest information to their children because their kids are smart. They're going to see what's going on. Um, they might make guesses or have worries that are worse than it even is. If they see somebody going in for a surgery that's actually preventive, they might think, what if that person 
is dying of cancer. So I think um, answering questions is helpful in most cases, as we said, testing isn't something that's recommended for, for children. Um, I'm going to go to the another easy category is for adults over age 25, genetic testing usually is an appropriate conversation. Um, testing can help these adults um, figure out if they're at higher risk, um, get access to appropriate medical tests and preventive measures. Genetic testing might give them information that they want to have when they're having children. Um, so if we think about people under 18, usually testing isn't the right answer. People over 25, a lot of times testing is going to make sense. Um, and don't forget about the true negatives that 25, you know, that 50% of these people will go in to do a test and get good news, find out that they're not at risk despite everything that's been happening in their families. Um, and then the sort of most individualized conversations, and I'm about to close a curtain one moment. <laughs> Um, the most individualized conversations and, and decisions really come with some of our young adults in that age range between 18 to 25, because in most cases, and I'll go into a bit more detail, um, they are still not at high risk. They don't need to do a bunch of cancer screening tests or preventive measures. Um, so um, it's really individual. There are people, we, uh, people who think that they want that information because there's a 50% chance that they don't have it and they can stop worrying, 50% chance that they do and they can start learning and preparing. Um, other people feel like they're still, again, making those big life decisions. What am I, you know, where do I want to do for a job? Where do I want to live? Um, things like that and, and decide to push this off a little bit further. So I, I feel like I've spoken to people with a full range of points of view um, in this age range. And that's where, as I said, those individualized conversations are really valuable. Um, and you know, we wanted to just mention some concrete things. Again, this is a quick overview. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pretty quickly, but just in terms of, um, timing for when to talk to family members, when does this information become important to them medically? As we said, it might be important to them sort of personally or emotionally earlier than this, but when does it become important medically? Um, it could certainly be um, when they um, would be at starting to have a risk of cancer and be recommended to do some screening. So for uh, people who are assigned female at birth, um, you know, most cisgender women um, who have breasts and ovaries, then breast cancer screening is recommended from age 25. Um, ovarian, we start thinking more about ovarian cancer risk around age 35 to 40 with BRCA1, a little bit later with BRCA2. Um, and there may be other things that we talk to people about, such as the option of risk reducing surgery for uh, breast cancer or certain medications that might lower their risk. So 25 is that age that we start thinking, oh, there really may be something you would do with this information if you are um, a woman. Um, for men, that really kicks in a little bit later with uh, male breast cancer screening recommended from age 35, prostate cancer screening recommended from age 40. Um, so again, there might be lots of personal reasons that people decide to test earlier, but this is when we really feel like it becomes valuable. And if you have a family member in these age ranges who hasn't tested, who doesn't know what's going on, it's really, um, you know, it's important to, to have those conversations. And I We'll just say nobody really feels like <clears throat> that's an easy thing to do, you know, uh, but it, the timing might not feel right. I was talking to someone the other day who said, you know, I don't want to, um, she just found out she's BRCA2 positive. I don't want to tell my daughter because her kids are just graduating from high school and she's really busy. Um, and I completely understand that having kids who are around that age and how busy and chaotic it is. But I also think you know, and I did say to her, I, I understand that. And I also you know, know that your daughter is right in this age range where we would be recommending that she make changes to her health care if she has this. So it uh, has a BRCA2 mutation. So as much as it can be a hard conversation to start, it might not feel like the right time. It's something that you could really use. Um, besides cancer screening and prevention. Uh, um, we also think about reproductive planning, which of course is very personal. And it always feels a little odd to me when I've just met somebody 20 minutes ago and I'm asking them what their plans are for having children. Um, but just um, this is information that a lot of people do like 
to have or want to have before they have children. Um, with BRCA1, if you are BRCA1 positive, meaning you have that mutation, there's a 50% chance of passing it on to each of your children. We saw that in the other slide, and that's the same with BRCA2. Um, BRCA2 also comes along with a different condition um, where, that is inherited in a again, more high school biology for you, where if both parents are carriers, if both parents have a mutation or a non-working gene, as they're showing here with that little X, um, it is possible that one in four of their kids are going to get both of those mutations, um, the, the two Xs, and that is going to cause a different condition I don't need to go into lots of detail about it, but you could imagine it's a more severe condition. It can affect children. What we typically say is if you're BRCA2 positive, thinking about having children, it may be worth talking about having the other biological parent or gamete donor um, tested. Most of the time when we do that, the other person does not have a BRCA2 mutation and the whole conversation can just be finished. But if they do, then there's more conversations to have. And as I said, this is very personal, but we do want to, um, you know, talk to people about options that range from conceiving naturally. Um, certainly some people decide to do that and say, you know, we have this information now, so we're better prepared for the next generation. My kids have 30 years head start on me. Um, and we'll, you know, go ahead and, and take the 50% chance. There are other people who've decided to um, do in vitro fertilization and test embryos and try to pick embryos that will not pass on that BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, and certainly other options like donor egg, donor sperm, adoption. Again, I'm not here to kind of go over all of this, but just reminding us why it's important to share this information with family members who might be having kids. Um, and again, just want to mention a couple of things that we, uh, we'll, I'm sure, be talking about on the panel and also um, just being aware of the opportunity to talk personally with a genetic counselor or a doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, that a lot of times, you know, this is very different from family to family. A lot of times people are afraid to test because they're worried about cancer, they're worried about the medical procedures. Um, you know, sometimes it's really hard as a parent to talk to your kids because just like the person I spoke to who didn't want to, you know, ruin her grandchild's graduation, you know, feeling protective, maybe feeling bad that this is something they have to bring that maybe they've passed on to their kids. Um, we sometimes talk about a, a concept of something called survivor guilt. Um, certainly there are some of those true negatives in families that actually feel really awkward. Of course, they're, they're glad to not have the mutation, but they may feel really bad that their family members have to go through this, or they may just feel like, you know, this is our family story and our family experience, and it feels weird to not be part of it, even though they're, they're glad. Um, and we also know a lot about cultural differences. There are families um, that don't talk about medical care. There's families that don't necessarily think about medicine in a preventive way, they, uh, people will say, you know, I, I go to the doctor if I'm sick. And this is maybe a very different concept to go to the doctor or the genetic counselor for preventive reasons. Um, so these are some of the other things I'm sure we'll be talking about. Um, and then I just want to finish up by talking about some resources and, and sort of next steps. If you're thinking about how am I going to go back and use the information from today to Probably you've already mentioned it one time to your family, but how do I go back and try to support more people getting tested? I, you know, it always starts with yourself and the old cliche of, you know, put on your oxygen mask before helping someone else. If you're in a good space, your medical needs are taken care of, your emotional needs are maybe not completely taken care of, I know, but you know, that that you've really thought about them, then that puts you in a better position to help other people in your family and they're gonna pick up on how you're handling this. Um, Look at some, you know, good, get some good information, which could be from us. We have information that you can share with relatives. Um, we have a website. Um, I want to mention FORCE, which is a really great, um, not affiliated, UCSF affiliated support organization with good information. Um, as genetic counselors, we're here to help um, with testing or even talking to people sometimes who aren't sure if they want to test or not. I'm not going to force you to test at the end of our conversation. I'm here to, to, to try to listen to you and share information and help you come to a good decision. Um, and then, as I was saying, sometimes it just takes a little bit of 
circling back. You might've mentioned this one time and it was kind of a shock. It might've happened at the time that people were getting diagnosed with cancer um, or somebody was graduating from high school and it, it wasn't the right time. Family members didn't get tested. And it's often really worth um, kind of circling back and having those conversations again, six months or a year later, because people may be um, in a different space in their life or just had a little bit of time to process things. Um, how can you get tested? Certainly, as I said, one of your options is to come talk to us as genetic counselors. We're here to give you good information, get the right appropriate medical test and provide all the follow-up in the clinic um, that Dr. Munster mentioned. Um, if you are seeking testing independently, um, it's really important to know there are a few clinical tests that you can order, um, you know, yourself that are good quality, but there are many that aren't. Um, I will you know, mention that things like ancestry testing and 23andMe are not considered really the right way to do this type of testing. Um, and again, we're happy to answer questions as we go along. And then that's really the background information I wanted to provide. Uh, we, as I said, have a great group of panelists here who can tell us so much more valuable information from their own experiences. And I'm looking forward to being part of it. Julie, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful overview. And like, uh, this is really enlightening and, and uh, really appreciated. And of course, um, Julie is available for more questions as uh, we go through the panels and then the Q&A. But I think a part of uh, also why we created this clinic is, uh, as Julie and I learned over the last, what, almost 10 years we've been working for, uh, together before the clinic, we had the clinic and even, and even after. Uh, once you're diagnosed with a mutation, science doesn't stop. And there's a lot of new development, new discoveries that come along. And I think it's really important that you have a place to come to for discussions on what's the right time for surgery, maybe what's the right time for treatment, screening, how about fam family planning, and how to test my family members. So I think we're really trying to create a, a space where patients get coordinated care that's very specific to their life circumstances, to their age, to their mutation, and to the current advances in, in medical technologies. And with this, Julie, please uh, stay on. And I'd like to have my welcome my panel members. Um, before I do this, I'd also like to uh, welcome Danielle Sipes, who has a uh, is a student at Berkeley, has been really helpful getting, getting this flyer up and running, making this program work. Uh, Leticia is a young doctor, Dr. Taniwaki from Brazil, who has been working with me hand in hand and uh, on our research program. Savannah Berkeley is uh, our BRCA research coordinators. Um, thank you all for your great input in, in making this happen. And then um, before I introduce the panel members, I would want to share a little bit my story with, um, with family testing. Of course, when I, was, when I first learned that I was positive, I really, really wanted to know whether my children carried the mutation. And particularly, I really wanted to know whether my daughter has the mutation, as it's a bit, for BRCA, it's a, it's a bit more relevant, a bit more relevant for, for girls. And my daughter at that time was, was eight or nine. And given the fact that I was, I'm a scientist and it's easy for me to do tests, I could have done this in, in a sort of like a, in a secret mission. I had this plan of doing a secret mission to get my daughter testing. So then I would know. Um, and because I really, really wanted to know that she was negative. Um, but then my good friend said to me, like, and how are you going to keep that secret uh, for until she's of age? And I thought about this and I thought, like, I'm really not very good at keeping secrets. So how am I going to carry this this secret with me? So I, I had her DNA on my desk for six months and was tempted every day to, to get her tested. And then I reminded myself that I'm a very strong propon proponent that People really need to be ready to be tested. And that has really has to be that individual's decision 
when and how they want to get tested. And I could just, for, for all of you who have a mutation and have children, I know it's really hard and you just so want to know. But I think this is something that you need to let uh, um, every individual decide when they want to when they want to get tested. I um, was fortunate to have uh, four panel members who all have been in the situation where they had to decide uh, should they get tested, should they have family uh, members get tested. And uh, I'm going to call on you, um, Rally Swearing, do you want to please turn on your camera? Rally is going to give her story in, in just a minute. Larry, um, please uh, turn on your camera. Um, then Alexandra uh, is here, right? Can you turn on your camera? There you are. Hi, Alex. And then Maxime Doubt, please turn your camera on. All of you have a unique way how you learned about your mutation and how you've been approached, how, how you've been approaching the family testing. And I think the fact that we have two females and two males on the panel is just how important we feel this is. This is not, BRCA is not a female disease. This affects both males and females. So it's really important. So um, Larry, why don't you start? Sure, doctor. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. And Julie, I really appreciated your presentation. I was diagnosed many years ago and I enjoyed seeing your presentation. A little bit about my story, if that's okay. Um, our family, we actually just completed the testing cycle that started for us all the way back in 2009. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2008 and was sent to UCSF to figure out if there was a genetic component. And uh, in early 2009, we figured out that yes, there was. My, uh, my mutation is called Lynch syndrome. While different than BRCA, I have many of the same, our family has many of the same concerns that uh, BRCA families have. Um, and for us, my wife and I met with um, one of uh, Julie's colleagues, a woman by the name of Amy Blanco, and she's been just fantastic for our family. And if I could just make a quick pitch, um, Please, people, if you haven't uh, engaged with um, UCSF's genetic counselors, please use them. They're a, a wealth of um, information, and um, they've been very helpful for our family. And really um, nice anyway. too. I'm sorry. And really nice people, too. And, and very nice people, too. Yes, absolutely. Um, we... Um, uh, we follow the recommendations that UCSF genetic counselors had for our family in terms of communicating. Um, our children at the time, when, when we were, when I was diagnosed with Lynch syndrome, were uh, 7, 12, and 14. And my wife and I had two priorities. One was um, figure out what we need to do to protect our children, right? And that's about when to test and what screening um, they will need to go through. Um, so that was priority number one. Priority number two was how do we let them be kids as long as possible? Don't, we did not want to burden them with a diagnosis of Lynch syndrome that we really wouldn't do anything with that information until the screening started at about age 20 um, for Lynch syndrome. So we made that decision to, um, to not tell our kids about Lynch syndrome until they were ready to be screened. Um, that is not simple. And I would think families would have to think very carefully about what the right strategy is for their family. So we did not talk to our children about Lynch syndrome. Um, until each one was just at that age to be tested. And then what I did was I, I sat down with uh, my oldest daughter, for example, um, and I explained to her, hey, we understand what caused my cancer years ago. It was a genetic mutation called Lynch syndrome. Um, there's a 50% chance that I pass this on to you. Um, the good news is that we can test for it, and obviously we can screen for many cancers, and you typically have a better outcome with cancers that are identified early. And I explained to my daughter that you know we've got an appointment coming up with UCSF's genetic counselors who can talk more deeply about the cancer uh, or the Lynch syndrome, the screening mechanism. They can do the test, um, and we had that same uh, that same conversation with each one of my daughters, each one of our daughters, as they reached about 19 or 20 years of age. 
One thing that was difficult for us is, you know, we always kept Lynch syndrome secret from our children to protect them. Uh, we asked the older children as we talked to them about Lynch syndrome to please not pass that information on to their younger sisters, again, to give them a chance to not worry about Lynch syndrome until it was time to be tested. Larry, thank you for this. Um, how about we go next to Alex? Hi, thanks for the invite. Um, my name is Alex. I'm 24. Whoa, I'm 24. And I found out about the BRCA mutation that I had when I was 19 because um, my mom had breast cancer first diagnosed, I believe, when I was 18. So it was pretty soon after when I found out. I wanted to find out just to do things about prevention, but also just to mainly soothe any anxiety I had, because for me, like the longer I let things fester, the more anxious I get. So for me, it was more like a mental health reason, I would say. Um, so at the same time that I got tested, my brother got tested and it was just a good thing to know um, because actually I was getting tested, doing blood work later for POTS and EDS and like cardiovascular things. And my doctor who did my cardiovascular um, blood test and cardiovascular test, he told me like, well, you have the BRCA gene. Like he told my mom and we're like, you know, like, yeah, it would have been like a very different thing to find out later on. Um, and a big thing for me and my family too, is like wanting to know about prevention, kind of like what Larry was talking about too, just knowing like this is cause for mutation mainly, um, and kind of seeing what can step, what steps can be taken for prevention. So like, for me, this is like kind of a weird motivator, but like it motivated me to be healthier as a person to like exercise more and to like not drink as much alcohol, um, and just to know like what affects me, what can like amplify my chances of getting cancer. But also I think it's just really important to get a lot of opinions too. Sometimes a lot of opinions can be bad because you have like a lot of people like talking in your ear, but at the same time, after I found this out, I was able to talk to so many doctors when I lived in the Bay area and then moving to LA, same thing here. Um, have like another doctor team down here to give me, you know, advice and like do screenings. And it really helps like any nerves I have. It's just a really great resource and support team to have. So I think it's really up to people to decide, especially if they're younger, because I was 19, um, to see if they want to get tested that young. For me, I'm glad I did. I just didn't want that anxiety to linger for a long time. I wanted to know more about prevention. I just wanted to know if I had it, period. Um, just to not have so many thoughts circulating in my mind, because it could have been a no, it could have been a yes, but I was just grateful to have an answer. So, okay, and I'll I'll come come back to this because I think uh, um, maybe Max, you can go next because you were the similar age when you got tested, right? Um, sure. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Max. Um, I'm 23. Very similar story to Alexandra. I also got tested when I was 19. Um, for similar reasons, I think I was just uh, didn't want that kind of like anxiety hanging around um, when it would be easier to just get tested and, and find out because then it, there's something you can do about it when you know, um, versus not knowing there's not really anything actionable there. Um, but I, I mean, I think for me, especially because I'm a, a male, it wasn't sort of existential. Um, that early. Um, so I figured better to know uh, than not. And then um, also because I have a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, and part of me felt like if I found out that that would help me um, give them some kind of information that they could use later on. Um, that's that's all I got. And then going back to what Larry said is like, uh, did you uh, did you talk to your siblings? about uh, your mutation you or Alex did you guys talk to your siblings about your mutation did you keep this to yourself how do you guys handle this I for, for me I am open about it with my family and close friends I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of at all and like when I've told my family and my friends like extended family close friends they totally you know are supportive they totally get why I would be tested this early I think if you have a great support system, they'll also understand that. And I think it's, you know, there's obviously a con if like my brother gets the mutation, like he has the mutation, but there's a pro in that, that we can like depend on each other and rely on each other just for any support we need. So it was kind of a great thing that my brother and I got tested at the same time. I think he was 23 or 24 at the time that he got tested. Um, 
and it was great that we had the answers that we did and not any more questions really. So I think it's great to have a good support system, whether it's your family or your friends. What about you, Max? How did you handle your mutation with your siblings? Um, yeah, I think just like, you know, being open about it and, and communicating, um, uh, you know, uh, my younger brother has the same mutation too. So um, I can't say that we've talked a bunch about it, but um, it's nice knowing that like, if I need to, um, there's someone there. Uh, and then obviously, you know, uh, my uh, mother also has the same mutation. So uh, there's that as well. So, so um, Larry, before I come back to you, is uh, Rally, how how was this handled in in your family? It's like you have a little bit of a unique story there. Hi, yeah, thank you. You know, um, I really learned that I was BRCA one uh, positive completely by chance. It was really just kind of a fluke. My sister was given a genetic test. Um, as a gift from a friend who worked for 23andMe uh, and got those results online and didn't see anything unusual or alarming about those results and didn't really think about them again until uh, five years later, uh, she ordered a DNA test for her dog and then sort of remembered, oh yes, I have uh, results as well and pulled them back up online. And so it wasn't until those five years later that she saw them again. And when she pulled them up, she saw BRCA1 positive written in red at the top of the page. Uh, so she, at that point, um, called me and my parents and my brother, uh, and we were all tested. My sister got retested. Um, and we sort of figured this mutation came um, from my mom because my maternal grandmother died of breast cancer when my mom was just one year old. Uh, but when we got the results back, we were really surprised because it wasn't from my mom at all. My mom was negative and it was my father who was the carrier. Um, and it was of no surprise actually to me that, um, when my sister tested positive, that I also, uh, tested positive people always, um, said we're twin look like twins. And so I just, I thought, gosh, if, if she was positive, there's no, no chance for me to be negative. I'm sure I'll be positive too. And sure enough, um, it was on uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, um, after um, I got tested, um, that my genetic counselor called me to tell me that I was also BRCA1 positive. Um, I also went through uh, UCSF and the um, genetic counselor was phenomenal and um, really appreciate her guidance. She told me that um, everyone carries a BRCA gene, um, but um, that, if you are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, you're like I am, and my family is, that your risk of having a mutation is one in 40. Um, and so, um, and at the time I had um, young kids, um, I my children were ages 10 and 13. Um, and we, my sister and I both had kids um, and were married at the time and, and um, our, decisions, both of us decided to have um, prophylactic surgeries um, to reduce our risk. And we were really grateful to have that option, even though that was not a choice we wanted to make or to do. We were really thankful to have that option of prophylactic surgeries once we had already had our children. Um, so the time felt really right. Um, and we felt really lucky because of this tremendous support as sort of Alex touched on that support was really, you know, of our families and our parents um, and one another. Um, felt really, really helpful. And that was seven years ago. And my um, daughter is now 18 and my son is 21. Um, and they have yet to decide. They don't know if they're positive or not. Um, my daughter, it's sort of on her radar, I think a bit more. She will likely wait until she's mid 20s to get tested. Um, and I expect my son will wait um, just a bit longer than that. Okay, there's a there's a question in the chat, and I'm gonna ask uh, both Alex and and Max the questions. Like, I mean, you both had mothers with breast cancer. How how much did that weigh in? And you're wanting to get tested. It's like, a, um, did the cancer diagnosis in the family make it more likely for you to get tested, or would you have, if you just had a brother who was a sister who was positive, would you still have gotten tested? 
I would say that having a grandma and my mom who both had breast cancer really augmented my desire to get tested for sure. Cause I was really curious too about what Raleigh was bringing up like prophylactic mastectomies. I'm like, would this even be an option for me? But I wouldn't know if I didn't really get tested. Um, so having, yeah, my mom and her mom both have breast cancer was like a big deciding factor for me to get tested for the gene. Um, even if they didn't have it, and even if it was just my brother, that would still be a good enough deciding factor for me, just having kind of like a family connection who has been tested and has been tested positive, that would have been enough. But it was definitely like more than enough to have my mom and my grandma both have cancer. That was like a big deciding factor for me, because again, I didn't want to worry about like prevention later, or if I already had cancer, then like wishing that I got tested earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a personal choice, but for me, I'm just a very like time savvy person. So I wanted to do it as quick as possible. What about you, Max? Um, pretty much the same. Um, I mean, obviously I don't think I would have gotten tested if I hadn't known that my uh, mom had breast cancer because then I don't usually do genetic testing just for fun. Um, but yeah, I think that was a big uh, reason to do it. Um, and then also just like part of me wanted to know if I had it because, um, you know, having a younger sister, like that was kind of my uh, worry is that, you know, if she has it, then that would be, um, you know, something else to, to consider. So um, if I could get the test and then maybe that would give her some information that she could act on. Thank you, Boson. Not to make this uh, unduly weird, uh, Max's mother is, by the way, me. Um, he's, uh, he is, uh, I think I tried my best to talk him out to testing early, but I think as you can hear from, from Alex and Max, despite what Julie and I, uh, we spend a, a fair amount of time trying to tell patients that they have time and they could wait until they are 25. What you're hearing from, from Alex and Max is it's sometimes when someone is ready, it, it really gets them out of their anxiety. So we try not to be, we try to be uh, as a, from a program here, we try not to be dogmatic. We try to be as open and supportive as, as we can. Um, I do feel very strongly that you know, when when you're in the middle of finals, that's probably not a good time to uh, to send off your test. So there's there's certain situation during your early years of college or anything where it's probably not the best to to get tested. I have a young patient who did test test herself when she was 12 weeks pregnant, and uh, needless to say, it made for a very miserable pregnancy for the rest of the for the rest of the pregnancy being being um, in this situation. Um, Larry, let's go back a little bit to your kids. It's like, how did your kids? Um, they obviously knew that you had cancer, but uh, they didn't know that you have a, a mutation that could affect their probability to have cancer. How? How did you start this conversation? How, what was the reaction? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I um, you know, when I was diagnosed with, um, with colon cancer, I mean, of course they knew that because they saw me go through surgery and chemotherapy and such. And then from that point on, shortly thereafter, when I was diagnosed with the Lynch syndrome mutation, I got into the screening mechanism. Um, you know, I'd go in for yearly colonoscopies and other doctor's appointments and scans and such. And for my children, I just explained that this was this was part of uh, a, aggressive screening to make sure that uh, we got rid of the cancer that I had, and that if anything else was to come along, we would we would catch it early. Okay, and and how about you, Raleigh? It's like, uh, how, do you kids know that, that do you have a BRCA mutation? Yeah. Be, so again, when I was, they were ages ten and thirteen when I first discovered this BRCA one mutation, and I told them in an age appropriate way about my mutation because I wasn't sick at the time. I had to explain why I was opting to have these surgeries um, and told them um, 
that, you know, I was BRCA1 positive. I explained in a very general way what that meant um, and told them that it was not something that they would have to worry about until, or even think about um, until they were uh, adults. Um, and at that point, you know, um, you know, medicine would, would maybe be a bit different at that time. And they may have different options when they were older than, than I did at this point. So there's a couple of questions here that, uh, and one is for you, Larry and Raleigh. So um, any advice on how to approach telling kids when you have multiple children? Larry, you mentioned telling each child when they turn 21 and asking not, them not to tell the siblings. Our plan is to tell the three kids all together when the youngest turns 21, the oldest male will be 25 at that point. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, for, for uh, a good question for us. I mean, I think that strategy worked well for, well, as well as it could for us because our children were younger. Um, I think the, 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 from what I've heard from the question, doctor, I think that strategy makes sense because at this point, their children are adults. They're full grown adults. We, we were trying to, we were trying to protect the younger kids by shielding them from the information. But with older adults, I, I or older children who are now adults, I would share uh, in that manner. Riley, what about you? I, you know, I, it's such an individual decision. It's so hard to say, but for me, it felt really right to share with both of our kids. Um, at the time when I first learned, um, I felt like it was going to be hard for us to um, keep from them, you know, why it was that I was going through these surgeries. So I had to explain it in some way. Um, but if they were older, um, I, I think I would have also done the same and, and shared with them at the same time. So I can speak a little bit from, from my family. So I, you know, we were very open about uh, my, I was very open about my BRCA mutation and uh, my father had uh, pancreatic cancer that was BRCA related. Um, pretty much a, a year after I got diagnosed. Um, my husband was very not, he, he, was, he was very leery of telling the, the children or getting the children tested sooner. So Max approached me and he wanted to know. Um, and I think Max, we didn't tell uh, your brother until he sort of like slipped out at one day, right? Yeah, I think that's pretty much exactly how it happened. I uh, told Max to use sun lotion because he was at high risk for melanoma and his very astute younger brother said, like, you don't know that yet, or do you? And so by that time, the cat was out of the the bag. So I think I, I think to, to, to add to this is you and your wife or, or uh, you or your husband may not be Obviously, you cannot you cannot hide a cancer, right? But uh, a lot of the time, it's not as obvious that a cancer is related to a family history. But when you start doing when you don't have a cancer and you start doing risk reducing surgery for a mutation that you have that predisposes you to cancer, um, most of our kids are really astute. I think they 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 get on to you very quickly. And then, uh, as uh, another person asked, is like. Max and Alexandra, would you have been upset if your parents didn't tell you and they just let you wait until you're 25? I think 25 is okay. I mean, I think just because the risk is so low at that age and it's not really my parents' fault. If I were to get cancer, it'd be a weird thing to blame. And especially because usually like when people don't tell you these things, family, it comes from a trying to be good place. Um, so it's a very sensitive topic. So I think you just have to kind of take it from both sides and really understand that maybe you want to know, maybe somebody else doesn't want to know. I think I got tested really early 19. So I wouldn't use me as like a base, like level point. I think, um, most people that I know got it like later in their thirties actually, or even like sometimes late twenties. Um, so I'm just very young. So I think if they waited to like 25, 26, or even like 30, like I wouldn't, be mad about that at all. I think 
I think it's hard because you want to protect your kids, but you also you want to protect them like mentally, but then you also want to make sure they don't get you know sick and don't get cancer. So it's, it's like a very hard line to cross. I do think for the most part though, if I had to pick, I would be a hundred percent more happy, just generally happier if my parents were honest with me than not. That's not to say it's being dishonest to hide the truth, but I think just knowing the truth, whether it's a good truth or a bad truth is always better than not knowing. So I would have been, that's why I was very grateful for my mom to tell me right away. Um, but I understand the parents want to wait. So it's really a parental decision and there's not really a right answer, I don't think. Um, yeah, I would, I would second all of that. Um, I think it's a very like uh, situation dependent. Um, for for me personally, I would have been upset, I think, if you would withheld that information. Um, but I, I really think it, it depends on uh, what the situation is. And uh, as parents, whether you think your your kids are like ready for that information or and again, as Alexander mentioned, it's not it's not like you can really do anything if you get tested at 19 anyway. So whether you do it, you know, 20 or 25, um, I think as long as you're below that sort of age where the, the testing um, becomes important, I think it, it doesn't matter that much. Um, I mean, the only caution would be like uh, to make sure that if you're withholding that information, it's because you are looking out for the well-being of your children and not because, you know, you're kind of uncomfortable about sharing that information or you don't know how to talk to that with your kids, because that I think might be something else. So the the other thing is like, I, I actually have to say like uh, my daughter wanted to get tested um, last year and I talked her out of it and uh, begged her to just let uh, a year of college go by and have a year where she doesn't have to worry about this and and uh and it was not in her head all the time and so my first question really was like are you thinking about it all the time do you need to know um for because you're anxious and she said no i just want to know and i we we both agreed that uh, it'd be really nice if she could go to a year of college and not know in a time when it really doesn't have a huge implication so i think she'll probably get tested now but i think that's that's different and i think just for everyone who's uh, who's attending, the voices of Alex are their voices, and that's what they want to do. And maybe we should have brought a panelist who didn't get tested. So I think um, if someone doesn't want to get tested, that's perfectly fine. There's really there's really not much or anything we do for BRCA one or two before before twenty five. This is very different for, for other diseases. We have other mutation where we start screening at a younger age, in which case that's that's very different. And Julie, do you want to talk a little bit about how we approach, uh, for example, a CDKN2A or like another mutation? And how, how, how do you talk to parents about this then? Um, yeah, I definitely can speak to that. And I just want to <clears throat> maybe capture some of the things that everybody has been saying here, as you said, I think there's a, a big range of individual feelings. And what you said is certainly that, you know, what you, the conversation you had with your daughter sort of saying, when do you hit that point where not knowing is harder than knowing? And if you haven't hit that point, then maybe it's, you know, good to live the rest of your life a little bit longer. I think Rally made a really good point that Sometimes kids are going to wonder what's going on if you don't say anything at all and they see you going for surgery, they might imagine something worse. So I think that honesty is really important. Um, and the, in answer to the question about the timing, again, every family is different and I appreciate what um, everyone has said. I did, I do remember talking to someone who was told when she was 24 um, and found it really hard. I think some of those people who are 21, 22, where, as you said, I felt very protective, even though it wasn't my kid, um, have said to me, you know, and I said, you know, there's nothing you need to do right now. And they said, that's a good feeling. It's a good feeling to just get the piece of information and know I don't need to do anything. I'm okay. Um, and I can kind of take a little bit of time to absorb that. Um, and the woman who found out when she was, you know, 24 and a half, she said, you know, it was just, I had no time to kind of adjust to the fact that this was in my family and then I was positive and then I needed an MRI and everything, you know, I didn't have that timeline. So again, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong, but I, realizing um, that knowing a little bit earlier 
sometimes gives people a little bit of time to absorb things without feeling rushed into lots of decisions and medical procedures. Um, but as you were pointing out, there are some genes where um, not BRCA1 and 2, where cancers can occur in children. Um, you gave an example of CDKN2A, which is a, a gene where if, if a family has a mutation, it increases the risk of melanoma and pancreatic cancer. Um, and we do sometimes see melanoma in teens. Um, uh, there's another condition called FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, where we see colon polyps in teens and colon cancer. Um, so those are, uh, when there's a medical reason, um, we do test children um, and generally sort of from a developmental and, and maybe medical ethical standpoint, um, there is a thought that sort of around that age of like 10 to 18, that the children should be involved in the conversation. It's not their final decision whether to test or not, but that they should, like people have said, well, can I just draw their blood or have them spit in the tube and tell them it's for something else? Um, and we, you know, again, work with each family individually, but I think that um, there's a, con so there's the concept of consent when you make that decision. And then for teens and tweens, we tend to talk of the concept of assent that they're sort of agreeing to something even if they didn't make that decision. And we want them to be able to have their questions answered. Um, a lot of times I'll talk to parents ahead of time separately and say, what's the language you've been using? What, you know, how much, is it okay to say this? Is it okay to say that? What's the word you use for this or that? So I you know, certainly don't want to overwhelm an 11 year old. And at the same time, I think um, most 11 year olds, it's not quite the right thing to do a test and not tell them what it is either. Um, so when we have to, there's a, a very different um, kind of family approach that we take. Um, I should say with the disclosure also that several with, of results, a lot of times those parents have asked to get the results without their kids present because they're going to be sad. They're going to be scared if, if their kids test positive um, and they want to be able to be sad or scared, um, not in front of their children and then kind of regroup and, and say, how am I going to go back and tell my you know, 13 year old who has FAP or um, something like that. So it's a very different procedure that we follow in those um, sort of families that have to think about the risk of childhood cancers. So the other uh, point I like to make is like, we really created this hereditary cancer clinic as a, as a place for people to get advice, support, screening, testing, treatment. But sometimes it takes longer until you're ready to do something. Sometimes it, uh, you're 21 and you don't want to know. And we talk to folks and we, uh, Julie and I had discussions with the young uh, adults whose parents were positive um, and didn't want to get tested, wanted to wait a year. And we, and I think having this discussion on saying like, it's fine to wait a year and having the discussion when screening actually starts uh, is, is really helpful. So I think, what we're truly really trying to create with this program is a place where people can get information, not where people get tested. In a, and I think, uh, Julie, you want to add to this? Yeah, and I think what you're saying really, well, there's several questions here from people who have family members who are quite reluctant or nervous about getting testing. And I think we all appreciate that, as you said, and we don't I don't think of myself as just someone who orders tests. I can do that if that's what you need, um, but I'm here to answer your questions. Um, and for some of the family members that people are referring to who might really be in the age where they sh would be screening if they were positive, um, I should say our, we do recommend, let's say you are 30 and your mom is BRCA1 positive and you just do not feel like you could handle that information right now, you're um, a woman, um, you have the option and we might even encourage you to do some of that extra breast cancer screening to get a breast MRI, to get the more frequent breast exams um, and, and see our nurse practitioners. So the people who have that 50-50 chance who don't feel ready to test will sometimes say, you know, maybe we should just offer you some of this testing as if you're positive um, obviously, we wouldn't want to do surgeries without knowing who's positive. Um, and in answer to some of the questions of how do we, you know, I think doing that helps protect them, which I've heard everybody talk about. I think that's everybody's 
important to everybody. And sometimes it convinces them, right? Because they're like, I don't like getting breast MRIs. And there's a 50% chance I don't have to, or a 50% chance that I understand that why this is so important. Um, and that sometimes even starting the screening helps push people a little bit towards testing. Um, so I certainly would say for those adult relatives who would be screened if they're positive, um, they might want to consider getting some scans. And sometimes that just helps them take the next step. Um, I've also, as I said, had many conversations with people, especially in that 18 to 25 age range who have said, you know, that's really helpful. It's better to, you know, just have all my questions answered and um, I'll, you know, call you in a couple of years. And, you know, my brother took probably five or six years to wrap his head around that he should get tested given the fact that our father had pancreatic cancer. Um, and it just took time. I think once we embark on this, it's like people need to be ready when they know this. And I think, uh, as, as Julie said, we, I have patients in a screening program and after the second time, and I say like, look, you could potentially eliminate all of this people get tested. You know, when you act on a mutation that you might not have, that's when I think usually you, you're able to get people to, to get tested. Um, you know, there's not a good, not a good answer. It's like, uh, if, uh, what do you do? It's like, we have, we have a, a lot of folks who, um, have a BRCA mutation, their brother doesn't want to get tested. His kids are, uh, at the age where they should start getting tested or screened and we can't force anyone and it's it's there's a high reluctance of of someone however if you have a let's say my i if we would test the uh, children of my brother if he still would not want to be tested julie how would you approach the children of of uh, the nieces and nephews of someone who has a mutation yeah, and I think that is uh, you know, something else that we saw in, in the Q&A. Um, it's tricky because when, if those nieces and nephews are um, adults, then they're, you know, the, as you said, that they have a right to make their own decisions. They might be getting to the age where they're at risk for cancer. Um, it is, every family is different. So I certainly don't want to be responsible for causing any family feuds. I think that depending on what your family looks like, there may be, if, if it feels appropriate and your relationship is appropriate, it may be time to let those people know um, that this is in the family, even though their parent has not tested. And I don't have the slides up anymore, but you know, if your parent doesn't have it, they can't pass it on. So if you think about the theoretically Dr. Munster's brother, if he hadn't tested and he was at 50% risk, um, we don't know. And then he had kids, what would, you know, what would their risk be? Um, so sometimes it is, if it seems right in your family to go straight to those adult children. Um, when we see those adult children, we let them know if you test positive, that will automatically tell us about your parent. And it's really tricky. You know, you want to be making medical decisions for yourself and they will have to make the decision that's best for themselves, but it's worth just knowing how am I going to say that to my dad? How am I going to keep it from my dad if he doesn't want to know. And we've, I think you, you and I have both seen a variety of those circumstances, including dads who were kind of okay with learning indirectly, but didn't want to take that step themselves. And so I think um, every family is different, but those, you know, we do talk to adult children sometimes, just letting them know though, that their test result might tell them about their parent. Um, a couple of other tips, which, you know, I, and as you said, our job is not to coerce people into testing by any stretch, but I think some of the things that I feel sometimes tip people are, as we said, starting the screening. Sometimes people think I'm being really healthy already. You know, I drink my water, I go for my walk, I, um, you know, I eat, I'm a vegetarian, and they think, what would I do differently? and realizing that, wow, you would really do a lot. Like a breast MRI is something really different than what most people are doing. So some people think, oh, it wouldn't change anything I'm doing because I'm really healthy already. Realizing that it would change, you know, that it would change something. 
On the flip side, some people don't want to get tested because they think, well, I'm not considering having my breast removed or I'm not ready to have my ovaries removed and therefore I'm not going to do this test at all. And for those people, I might say, you know, remember there are things that we can do, whether it's again, that MRI or extra screening, extra prevention um, that doesn't go as far as surgery. So I think that there are sometimes a, a misconception that you either have to do everything or do nothing. And in fact, you know, we can do screening that is non-invasive that can be really helpful. Um, and then what I said earlier, I think is something that I still emphasize is it's nobody wants to get that piece of paper that says that they are positive. Um, it's a really hard thing to find out. Um, and again, those of us who work here know that there are people who found out because they had can't, they got a piece of paper that said they had cancer and then they found out they had a mutation. So if you have a mutation or not, it's already there. Um, and finding out from that piece of paper is hard. Um, and it's probably easier than finding out after you got a cancer that maybe you could have caught earlier or prevented. So I try to say that in the least heavy handed way to people, but I think that's some of the really honest conversation that you have to have with adult relatives. It's like, I know you don't want to hear this. I hope you don't have this, but if you have it, you already have it. And I would so much rather you find out from a test than from a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I don't, you know, want to be that blunt about it, but that's, you know, the truth. To add to this a little bit, you know, why, why testing early is like a, and, you know, having a positive test does not need, mean that you have to sacrifice your, your breasts, because we know from pretty extensive data now, if we screen women with the MRIs and mammograms, the likelihood that they, present with a cancer that is small and curable and requires less treatment is actually pretty high. That being said, though, it's like a, I can tell from personal experience, of course, I'm a breast cancer oncologist. I never thought I would have breast cancer. I had a mammogram and then found out that I had breast cancer and then found out that I needed to have a mastectomy and I had very little time to prepare anything. And within three or four weeks, you find yourself finding a surgeon, you find a plastic surgeon, you start worrying about your life, you start worrying about treatment. Um, if I had known younger that I had a BRCA mutation and our family was not a classic, I, I would have had a lot more time to, to just wrap my head around these things, have a team in place, um, and, and, and not everything happens overnight. It was, it was extremely devastating to get all of this done um, at the same time. So I think for the, the attendee who's asked is like, how to deal with a highly educated but reluctant female relative. Um, you know, I just think like the, the risk for the risk for breast cancer for BRCA1 or 2 is almost 70% over life. That's just very, that's just very high. So the chance that you have a breast cancer when you have a BRCA mutation is just very high. And like, and even if you don't want to do a risk reducing surgery, just being a little bit more prepared. Um, and, and breast cancer does not come when it's convenient. It hits you right not in a time when it's it's convenient, then it really can be very upsetting. And um it is nice to have several plastic surgery options and talk to multiple people and find a doctor that that you like instead of finding the doctor that you get assigned to because that's the person who has time the next three or four weeks. Um, and I think uh, probably the same is true, Larry, for you, right? It's it's uh, finding the 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 team who does your screening a little bit before you have to do it. That is probably pretty helpful. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, doctor. I, I found out I had colon cancer. I mean, I was lucky I found out. My dad had it, and I asked my general practitioner, what should we do? And he said, well, you're not of the age to do a colonoscopy, but be safe. Go get one. And it saved my life. Um, I, was, I was very pleased. And then, oh, well, very pleased to, that it saved my life. Obviously, that sounds dumb. I'm sorry. Um, it saved your life. You got diagnosed <laughs> earlier. <laughs> 
And then it was a few months later that we found out, oh, that can't, I have Lynch syndrome. So that's probably why I got this colon cancer. And it, in some way, um, getting that diagnosis to, of Lynch syndrome, it explained some things to me why I got colon cancer young. And one of the things I've tried to, to communicate to my children, who, by the way, I'd like to acknowledge, I think they're all on the line today, um, is that it, it arms them with the information that they need to help keep them safe. What's the screening mechanism that they need to go? When do they get colonoscopies? When do they see the gynecologist? What are the things they need to do to best keep themselves safe? Raleigh, do you want to talk a little bit about how you're going to approach your kids? In terms of when they get tested? or I mean, it's very much their decision, but what Julie said really resonated with me. And it, I felt it's why I felt so strongly about getting tested and didn't really question whether or not that was the right thing to do. Um, I think having preventative options before there's a cancer diagnosis is is for me was the driving force. And I and I would encourage my kids to do the same. Um, but they, you know, they also um, have seen me on panels. We we talk very openly about this diagnosis. My daughter just is in a genetics class in school at the moment. She did a BRCA research paper, um, and so uh, they are um, learning as they go, and and will sort of make decisions accordingly. And then questions uh, I, I have for Alex and, and maybe Max is like, uh, now you have this mutation. When you share this with the, when you're dating, when, when, when you share a mutation like this, it's like, you know, all of us, we were diagnosed at the, at the later age, we already been married. So this was never, this is our spouses were kind of stuck with that, right? If you will. So for you, it's different. How are you going to approach that? Not the first date. I mean, I've never dated, so I don't really know. Um, I would say if you have a, I think when you realize that you're comfortable in a relationship, though, that's when you know it's good to tell somebody. If you have trust about so many different things, this is just one more thing to add to the pile, to be honest. I don't think your partner should judge you differently for it. Um, it obviously depends how fast moving your relationship is. Like if you want to start a family, you want to get married and all that, or if it's more of just like a flourishing, fledgling thing, just starting out. Um, I do think though, for like younger relationships, because again, getting tested at 19, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't urgent. So there's really no reason for me to like go and tell my friends, but I did anyway, just because I trusted them. And I wanted a good support system and just to be able to talk about it and get it off my chest. Um, and I think sometimes people also think like, well, do you regret getting tested? Because now, you know, and you got the positive like test result, like, do you regret it? And honestly, no, I think I would have regretted it more if I kept waiting, but I know everybody's different. So some people might think it's totally different, like do the exact opposite and be like, I just don't want to know. It's like totally valid. So I think when you're in a relationship, I think as long as you trust the person with anything and everything, this is just another one thing to add. And I think, um, you know, nobody has like super perfect health. That'd be awesome, but I don't think it's the case. And so, you know, if you tell your partner about your diagnosis, like they could open up to you and like vice versa. I think just being able to tell people whether it's romantic or a friend or a family member, I think that's really important, so. Um, I was going to say the first date, um, maybe even put it in your, uh, your profile, you know, but um, no, I would, I would say you probably don't have to, to lead with that. Um, I think it is, it is a thing that's naturally going to come up when you talk about um, sort of family and stances and like, you know, when you're talking about kids and stuff like that. Um, and I, it's definitely not a thing that I think is good to hide. And if you find that you're not being honest with someone, um, I think that's doesn't say much for their relationship and that's and not going to go well going forward. And I think it is important because, um, again, it lets your partner kind of know what they're getting into and like make decisions that are going to be good for um, your family going forward. So um, there's a, another question. So a uh, question for Alex and Max. Uh, 
Do you think about your positive status on a day-to-day -day basis? And are you doing anything differently uh, that you might do otherwise for your age? I honestly don't think about it that much. I mean, it could be different for anybody and everybody. I just personally don't. I did for a bit and it was kind of a while after I got diagnosed and I was researching prophylactic mastectomies and hearing all these different opinions. And that's probably when I thought about it the most. Um, so it kind of fluctuates, but really for the most part, it's been math five years. And so I haven't really thought about it that much, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think I would have been thinking about it more if I never got tested in the first place. Um, so that's why I'm glad I did. Again, different for everybody though. Um, yeah, I would I would agree with that. I'd say that it doesn't come up that often. I would actually say that um, I think it's the people around me who tend to think about it more than I do. Um, like, you know, uh, my uh, my mom has reminded me many times uh, about that, you know, when it comes to like putting on sunscreen or, or drinking alcohol or stuff like that. But um, I would say that, yeah, like day to day, it's it's not something I really think about that much. I, I think that mom would remind you about sunscreen and not drinking as much alcohol, uh, probably on a mutation or no mutation. It's not what moms do. Um, Riley and uh, you have not had cancer or not had cancer, hopefully never. How often do you think about uh, your mutation and the chance of having cancer? That's a good question. I, I think... Um less maybe now than I did um, when I was, you know, initially after surgeries, um, I thought about it a lot. Um, and I guess I, I guess even when I think about it now, um, it doesn't feel burdensome or consuming or um, a, like a difficult thing to think about. I sort of, it, it's just, become sort of part of the fabric of who I am, I would say. What about you, Larry? Yeah, I think about it relatively frequently, um, a lot in terms of just managing the screening. When's my next MRI of my head? When do I get the MRI of my abdomen and pelvis? When do I get the blood test? When's the next doctor's appointment? I'm a spreadsheet type person, so I keep the spreadsheet and just manage my schedule that way. Um, and then now that you know, each of our children were, each of our children were diagnosed with Lynch. I, I try to help, I'm a, a pest for them, trying to remind them when they need to do such things. And I think I, I will say from experience I have with patient and also experience I have from myself, it was very, very acute the first maybe year or two when it was really in front and center. Um, and then I think it's, a, as Raleigh says, it's, a, it's really a little bit like it's the new normal and it's part of your fabric. You go for your screening. And I got, at least for me, having done all my risk-reducing surgeries, I felt like I, I've done my part. Um, and life is really not completely safe. So, uh, but I think... I, I think it's definitely, there's definitely a timing factor that it's, when you first get tested, you think about it. At least I thought about it a lot more. And that's going back to there is really a right time to, to get tested. Because I think it's, um, Alex, I don't know how, how you feel about when you first got tested versus now, or like uh, the difference. Like, uh, so. Yeah, I think when I first got tested, there was some anxiety there. I think now, kind of whatever, like most people, kind of we're saying is like I think about it quite a bit less but I feel like it would be different if I was my mom because I know she was thinking about it a lot because she had me and my brother to also think about so it's kind of like the more people you have in your family it might be more pressing on your mind but that's like a 19 year old when I was so young and I'm still young 24 but when I was really young and I didn't really have to worry about it too much because I was just way under the age limit for a lot of like the big concerning times of my life to be worrying about this it wasn't really on my mind, but again, totally different from my mom who really wanted me to get tested. Um, but even if she didn't really want me to, I still would have gotten anyway. Um, but I'm just glad that my parents supported me either way to get it or to not get it. 
Hey, um, Julie, there's a couple of questions before you stop about the, the you know, what, what does it mean health insurance wise? So can you comment a bit on that? That may be a good question to answer. Yeah, I think that's uh, something that is on a lot of people's minds. Um, first, I wanna emphasize that for health insurance um, and employment, most people are covered by a federal law from 2008 called GINA or the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act um, that prohibits health insurers and employers from using a genetic diagnosis against you. And um, so I think that's an important piece of information. And again, if you can talk to an individual genetic counselor, not that we're insurance experts, but you know, there's certain exceptions to that if you, depending on what type of insurance you have or military. Um, things like life insurance or disability insurance don't have as many kind of broad protections. And um, so there are times where people have said, you know, um, maybe to be completely safe, maybe I'll say it the other way. First of all, I will say a lot of times people aren't, don't ask when you go for those. So I certainly know people who are BRC positive who went to get a life insurance policy and they said that was not one of the questions and they got their life insurance policy. And um, so you don't have to worry about it. it isn't always a problem, but if you want to be completely safe, there are people who have said, I'm going to go get my life insurance before I get tested so that I can just, if somebody asks me, have you ever had a genetic test that says you're at increased risk for cancer? You can say no, because you haven't done it. Um, so I do want to emphasize that actually, I think we're in a pretty good spot now. There are good protections, um, a little bit less secure for things like life insurance. And so if you want to be completely safe, you could apply for that before you get tested. Um, but it hasn't been a problem for several people that I've talked to. So before we wrap up, I'd like to give all of you an opportunity to say a few parting words to just like what, what you can impart on others after you've gone through that. Like, uh, Riley, do we start with you? Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, the main reason really why I share my story, even though I'm really much more of a private person, is because of just wanting to bring awareness um, to this BRCA mutation that I have. And I think just by being on this panel, um, everyone here is already um, working to make informed decisions about their own health. Um, and just to um, share what you've learned um, on this panel with the other people um, in your family and, and, and friends who may be um, impacted. Um, and that way, hopefully you don't, and, and they don't have to uh, leave it to chance or an illness or a, or a dog um, like I did um, to learn about their own BRCA status. Larry? Yeah, I think I'll just reinforce uh, something I had said earlier that, um, you know, each each family has to make their own decision that's right for them. But please, if uh, available, engage with UCSF's um, uh, genetic counselor team. I found them to be immensely helpful for us. Max? Um, I would say, like, again, I think the decision to get tested, obviously, is very personal um, and it's, I don't think there's a right time to, to get tested or to, to ask questions like that. But I would say that I don't, there's, I don't think there's really anything wrong with just being honest and talking with um, people who care about people in your circle about what you're feeling um, and, you know, see what they have to say. And then I think go from there. Alex? I would say the most important thing for me was learning that there was no shame in whatever I chose. So getting tested, not getting tested. And then after I got tested, thinking about prophylactic mastectomy or not getting one, you know, all, all these different things and all these different steps. So there's really no right or wrong decision. It's so personal that you shouldn't feel shame in whatever you choose. You should listen to people, you know, and talk to people. I think don't keep everything inside, but don't have anybody force their opinion on you. It's really going to come down to what you want, what you think is best for you mentally, physically, whatever. So definitely talk to people, talk to people you trust. Don't keep this inside to you if it's something you're anxious about. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. If you make the decision, there's no shame in that. And before I, I thank everybody, I think it's what I really like to add here is, you, you know, 
if it's not the right decision for you to get tested today, then that's okay. There's, it is not something as it's like, this is a risk for having cancer. This is not having cancer. I think that's a really important difference, right? You don't have to rush out and find that surgeon in the next two weeks because you don't have cancer. You have potentially a 50% chance of having an increased risk for cancer. That can be delayed. Um, and do it when it's right. And I think, but what your our panelists are really saying is like, um, it's something that becomes at some point the new normal. It becomes part of your fabric. Um, and there's an enormous amount of support. Does it get, I think the one thing I learned in my life when I had breast cancer is just how many friends I had. I was never aware how many friends and supporters I have. And, like a, um, and yeah, at the same time, as an oncologist, my heart breaks when I see a young woman presenting with a big, nasty breast cancer that we could have prevented if we only acted on it. So, Julie, thank you really, really very much for your presentation. Um, Leticia, Savannah, and Danielle, thank you for making this work. This is uh, the first of our six workshops this year. Um, we will talk specific topics at the outline, and then uh, Larry, Rally, Alex, and Maxime, I cannot thank you enough for, for sharing with this because uh, I, I'm very sure this is very helpful for many. Thank you so much and have a good evening. <laughs>